Massacres Monster Madness. Monster is our key word here, so let's start off with one of the most famous, if not the most famous monster, the one created by Dr. Frankenstein. It's alive! The image most people are familiar with is Boris Karloff from 1931, but we're not fucking around. We're going all the way back to 1910. This is the version produced by Thomas Edison Studios, and it's the first film adaptation of Mary Shelley's novel. It's a short film, so it tells the story in a concise and interesting way. Here, Frankenstein doesn't need to stitch bodies together. Instead, he throws a bunch of chemicals into an oven or something. Instant monster. That's a lot easier, isn't it? The special effects are interesting, and the monster itself looks like nothing you'd expect. There's also this creative mirror shot showing the monster's reflection. And I can't help but feel there's some deeper meaning that Frankenstein seeing the monster as a reflection of himself. I think it's pretty sophisticated and a well-made film for its time. For many years it was said to be a lost film, so the fact that we're even looking at it is like seeing the Holy Grail. Think about it, what you're looking at is a film that's a hundred years old, with only one known surviving print. It's the first screen incarnation of the world's most famous movie monster. It shows new filmmaking techniques, and it got banned because it was too shocking for the time. So I think it's fair to say this may be the most significant horror film, and one of the most important science fiction films too. It's great that they found this thing. Now if only we can find a copy of London After Midnight, the balance of horror history can be restored. Monster Madness. I remember in the early 90s when the Universal Monster movies were coming out on VHS, there was this one that they advertised as a collector's treasure, the Spanish version of Dracula. At first, I didn't understand why it was such a big deal. I figured it was just Dracula translated in Spanish. But no, Universal simultaneously shot two versions of the same movie. The Spanish version has the same script and the same sets but the cast is entirely different. The English version is by far the most famous. Who could possibly not know Bela Lugosi? I am Dracula. But would you believe the Spanish version is actually better? For example, if we look at this scene in the English version where Renfield first meets Dracula, we see it's just a simple static shot. But in the Spanish version, the camera actually moves, making the scene more dramatic. And this is just one example. It just overall has more production value. There's many added scenes that you don't see in the English version, and it also shows a little more violence. And Helen Chandler's dress is much less revealing than Lupita Tolvar's. It all shows how less uptight Spanish audiences were. When you think of the English version, it's hard to forget such demented, magnificent performances like Lugosi and Dwight Fry. Rats. 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 But the Spanish actors also do a great job, unique amongst themselves. Pablo Alvarez Rubio is full of frantic energy. Every second he's on screen, you can't take your eyes off him. Carlos Villarías makes a great Dracula. The best part about him is his face. He looks completely crazy. It's very much different from the Lugosi stare but creepy in its own way, and hilarious. It's almost impossible not to prefer Lugosi. Aren't you drinking? I never drink. Why? When comparing these movies, it makes you just wish Lugosi was in this movie instead. But either way, the Lugosi Dracula is a beloved classic that improves every time you see it, so if you're very familiar with it, it only makes the Spanish version even more fascinating because it's like seeing the same movie in a new way. Yo nunca bebo vino. And for that, it's really a treat.
in Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Welcome to the world's first zombie movie. If you're used to blood spurting and heads getting chewed off, then this isn't the movie for you. Though it may not excite by use of gore, it has a different kind of power. Watching it is like going into a dreamlike state. With Bela Lugosi staring at you half the time, you actually feel like you're being hypnotized. He plays the leader of the zombies, and he's in top performance, fresh off of Dracula. Speaking of which, this is not Universal, the studio that dominated the horror genre for the 30s and 40s. No, this was independent, so it gets overshadowed by everything else, like Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Mummy. I sort of consider it the rebel of the bunch, but its legacy doesn't go unnoticed. Rob Zombie used it as the name of his first band. It shows some new filmmaking techniques. There's that close-up of Lugosi's eyes that just float until they land on his head. There's framing through objects, and there's a dialogue scene where the camera starts behind the actor's back. Then all the dialogue happens in one single take. By the end of the scene, the camera goes back to the same spot it started. It's a quiet movie, and you may find it slow, but it really does have a hypnotic effect, and by the end, you feel like a zombie. <laughs> it's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. When I think of the old dark house, I think of the perfect creepy movie. A group of people get lost in a storm. They stop at an old house where they meet the Femmes. The Femmes are an eccentric family who are reluctant to let them stay, but given the circumstances, they give them their hospitality. They have gin and potatoes, and that's about it. Have a potato. Not much happens, except for the butler getting drunk and going crazy. He's played by Boris Karloff. This was produced by Universal right after they made Frankenstein, so it only makes sense they cast him again. But you can see how badly he was typecasted. He's just a lumbering brute who doesn't speak a single line. It wasn't until The Mummy when they finally let him talk. Ernest Thessinger plays Harris Femme. He's creepy, funny, and just totally delightful in the role. Only gin. I like gin. Later, he played Dr. Pretorius in Bride of Frankenstein, one of the best mad scientists of all time. The Bride of Frankenstein. Charles Lawton's in it, too. He's a jolly fellow, and he seems to balance the somber mood. Anyhow, before we knew where we were, something had fallen down and smashed the car in. <laughs> Later, he was Dr. Moreau in Island of Lost Souls and as the Hunchback in Notre Dame. Gloria Stewart's in it, too. You might know her from Titanic. That's what you call a long career right there. As the plot unfolds, they learn more of the family's tragic secrets. This is an unlucky house. Two of my children died when they were 20. And then other things happened. Madness came. <laughs> they have this crazy maniac named Soul locked up. You find that he's actually pretty friendly, but you just know that he's up to no good, and that makes for a very tense and suspenseful scene. <laughs> and there was a javelin in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the javelin. <laughs> what makes the movie so great is the chilling atmosphere. Everything's so dark, the constant sound of thunder and rain just enhances it. It's a movie that, for as simple as it is, it just lives up to its title 100%. Turn out the lights, sit back, and watch the old dark house. It's Sin Massacre's Monster Madness. I have to admit, this is a tough one to talk about because it's such a strange story. Basically, it's about sideshow performers, real, deformed people who are being mistreated. Gobble, 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 gobble. The main character is a little person named Hans who marries a big person named Cleopatra. But she's just a greedy bitch and all she wants is his money. Freak! It isn't really a horror film until the last scene where the quote-unquote freaks make their revenge. Dracula director Todd Browning chose to cast real carnival performers, the most striking being a man with no legs, and a man with no arms or legs. Watch him light a cigarette.
We've got bigger time to follow. And could this no, guy be the basis of Porky go. Pig? Oh, boy. You're always using that for an excuse... For, for an excuse... For an alibi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, folks. Well, Freaks came out in 1932, and the first Porky Pig cartoon was in 1935. Makes me wonder. For 1932, this movie was so shocking that it was banned. With a title like Freaks, most people saw it as an insult to people with abnormalities. It wasn't until decades later when people finally started to see it and understand what it was about. It's a movie where the normal people are the bad guys, and asks the question, what does it mean to be normal? What sticks out to me is the final horror scene where they're crawling in the rain under carnival wagons. And with no musical score to complement it, it only makes it more haunting. God, that's so creepy. It tells a unique story. It's bizarre, entertaining, but only suffered from one thing, being ahead of its time. Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. Watch this movie and you're in for a treat. The Invisible Man by Frankenstein director James Whale, based off the H.G. Wells novel. Jack Griffin is a scientist who succeeded in turning himself invisible, but the only problem, he can't turn himself back. At first he tries to find a cure, but the power of being invisible overcomes him, and gradually he becomes a lunatic with a desire to rob and kill. The nation that wins my secret can sweep the world with invisible armies. For 1933, the special effects are amazing. No computers, just primitive optical effects. Griffin's played by Claude Rains, the same actor who later played the Wolfman's father and the Phantom of the Opera in the 1943 color remake. He has a great voice for the role. Power to walk into the gold vaults of the nations, into the secrets of kings, into the holy of holies. Power to make multitudes run squealing in terror at the touch of my little invisible finger. Even the moon's frightened of me, frightened to death. He pulls off being sympathetic and ruthless at the same time. Then you'll do a somersault and probably break your arms. Then a grand finish up with a broken neck. <laughs> He's such an asshole. The movie has got to be the funniest of all the Universal movies. I highly recommend it. Here we go gathering nuts and may, nuts and may, nuts and may. Here we go gathering nuts and may on a cold and frosty morning. The one thing you may find irritating is Una O'Connor. The Invisible Man! All she does is scream. Sounds like a parrot being fucking raped. You'll be so annoyed, you'll actually find yourself laughing about it. The cops, too, are very funny. When they get called to the inn to arrest Griffin, the first officer doesn't even seem to care what's going on. Hey, what's all this? It's the stranger with the goggles. He's gone mad. He's assaulted Mrs. Hall and nearly killed her husband. Huh? And that's when Griffin starts taking off his clothes, showing that he's invisible. Now you'll suffer for it. You're crazy to know who I am, aren't you? All right, I'll show you. <laughs> this is the first time anyone sees this happen. Wouldn't you be scared shitless? Well, not this cop. He's invisible. This was the matter with him. Oh, that's all? He's just invisible? Wouldn't you be like, oh my god, holy shit, he's fucking invisible? Then there's the monotone cop. He's got to sleep. They might catch him asleep. Was this intentional? Was the guy under hypnosis? Or is this the world's worst actor? Anyway, The Invisible Man is a great movie, full of thrills and laughs. Definitely check it out. Oh, I see. Pretty good. Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. It's about time King Kong gets a monster madness. I'm ready to praise the everlasting shit out of his big fat hairy ass. I can't possibly praise this film enough. There's no way I can do it justice. So what, should I talk about the plot? Well, just for the hell of it, here's the gist. Carl Denham's a filmmaker on a voyage to Skull Island, an uncharted mystical land where prehistoric creatures run amok. 
He brings with him a young lady named Anne Darrow, who he casts as the lead actress. But the natives of the island capture her as a sacrifice to their god, the giant ape, Kong. But Kong finds a unique interest in her and carries her off into the jungle. Denim and his crew venture in to get her back. In the end, Kong's captured and brought to New York City where he escapes, retrieves Anne, and climbs the Empire State Building in one of the most iconic finales of all time. This is the stuff in which legends are born. I saw it when I was a little kid, and I was never the same after it. I found out later that I was not alone. It seems every filmmaker from Ray Harryhausen to Peter Jackson was inspired by it as well, and I saw it in the 80s. I can't even imagine how revolutionary it was back in 1933. Everything about it is entertaining. The jungle has such a magical quality. I love staring into the background just knowing that all that stuff was crafted by hand. But the more times I see it and the more I analyze it, the more I fall in love with this movie. I highly recommend getting the double DVD release. On the second disc, there's a seven-part documentary detailing the making of Kong. As you probably know, King Kong and all the dinosaurs are stop motion, but it's hard to imagine the hard work that went into it. To animate one minute's worth of film could have taken 150 hours. And to combine the live actors with the stop motion footage, they had to invent all these new techniques. Sometimes the actors were performing in front of a rear projection. Other times, the two pieces of footage were composited together. And other times, the scenes with the real actors were projected into the background, frame by frame, while the stop motion creatures were being animated around them. Also, there were full-size parts of Kong, such as the hand, the face, and the feet. For example, the scenes were Kong stomping people in the ground, or putting them in his mouth. There's also a great moment on the DVD in which Peter Jackson and company recreate one of the movie's lost sequences, the spider pit scene, using the same crude techniques. These modern filmmakers found it to be a huge challenge, and that really says something. For 1933, it's just unbelievable what they accomplished. Still to this day, a lot of it's a mystery. It's not like now when a movie comes out, there's documentary footage and DVD bonus features up the ass. You know every last detail of how a movie's made. But back then, they knew better to keep a lot of it secret. It was more for the art and not just the money. Not to mention, we don't have the luxury of speaking to Willis O'Brien or any of the people associated with it. And let's not forget the sound design, which is equally one of the most important parts that make a movie. You have Kong roaring, which was a combination of different animal growls. You have a fully orchestrated musical score, and it's all blended together so well. And don't forget, this is a time when sound movies were still in their infancy. I can't think of anything that even comes close to being this groundbreaking. In film school, professors shove Citizen Kane up your ass and tell you it's the best movie ever made. Well, that too is a very monumental film, and it pioneered a lot of new techniques. But look at Kong, nearly a decade before it. Phenomenal visual effects, phenomenal soundtrack, and a timeless story of Beauty and Beast. It's an excellent film on every level. Why can't that be the best movie ever made? It shows fantasy and imagination, and that's what movies are all about. I'm bowing down and my balls are clapping. Okay, this is going to be a fun one. Today we have a double feature. In the 30s, Universal made three films based on the stories of Edgar Allan Poe. The first was Murders in the Rue Morgue, starring Bela Lugosi, a film which owed a lot to the German Expressionist era, like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. But the two movies I want to discuss are The Black Cat and The Raven. It's impossible to talk about one without talking about the other. They both star Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff, and for each actor, it's one of their best performances. The Black Cat was the first movie they starred in together. Lugosi plays Dr. Vitas Vertigast, who just got out of a horrible prison camp where he says the soul is killed slowly. So he's basically insane and out for revenge against the man responsible, Perlzig, played by Karloff. He's a devil worshipper who likes to keep the bodies of dead girls in glass cases. 
His first appearance in the movie just shows his distinct silhouette, and in his first scenes barely says a word. It lets you know how seriously badass he is, and it's a great introduction. Perlzig stole Vertigast's wife, killed her, and then married Vertigast's daughter, so there's no reason not to consider him his enemy. These men hate each other's guts and just want to rip each other to shreds, but there's one thing slowing them down. There's innocent honeymooners staying at the house who just happen to have the bad luck of getting caught up in the whole mess. Furthermore, Perlzig wants to sacrifice the poor girl to Satan. Vertigast wants to fight for the girl's freedom, and it all slowly escalates into a struggle to the death. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do to you now. Fair the skin from your body. Slowly. Bit by bit. Both performances are outstanding. Lugosi has a lot of haunting monologues. He communicates so well with his eyes and savors every line spoken. Karloff's always got that shit-eating grin with his commanding presence. He asks for no sympathy, like in Frankenstein or even The Mummy. Here, he's just a bad motherfucking epitome of evil in its dirtiest and most unpussified form. The architecture of Perlzik's home is so surreal, we believe that we're inside his world. The most misleading aspect to the whole film is that it really has nothing to do with the Poe story. There is a black cat in the film, but it has little to do with the plot. However, the idea of a black cat as the symbol of evil sort of sets the mood for the whole film. He has an intense and all-consuming horror. With all its implications of torture, rape, necrophilia, and Satanism, it's no wonder why this movie was so shocking in 1934. Next came The Raven in 1935. Lugosi plays a surgeon named Dr. Valen, who's obsessed with the writings of Poe, particularly The Raven, again the symbol of death, which he describes as his talisman. Essentially, Valen is a hero. He saves lives. When a young woman Jane's brought to his care after suffering a near-fatal car crash, Valen is the only doctor skilled enough to save her. But with a great genius comes great ambitions. Valen falls in love with her. The father tells him to stay away and respect her happiness. But Valen feels betrayed that they owe him for saving Jane's life. So what happens? He goes mad. All he wants now is to torture the father and the potential husband using a swinging axe. It's inspired by yet another Poe story, The Pit and the Pendulum. But to capture his victims, he enlists the help of a criminal named Edmund Bateman, and that's where Karloff comes in. Bateman wants the doctor to change his face. Valen agrees, but it's only part of his evil plan. He ruins half of Bateman's face and promises only to fix it if he helps him carry out his vile scheme. So it's like the roles are reversed. Like in Black Cat, both characters are bad, but Lugosi this time is the real villain. Both actors reenact some of their most famous trademarks, Lugosi's demented facial expressions, and Karloff even does the Frankenstein monster growl. The reason why this movie's worth seeing so much is because of Lugosi. He's at his best when he's playing over-the-top maniacal villains. What are you trying to do to me? Torture you. Oh, try to be sane, Valen. I am the sanest man who ever lived. But I will not be tortured. I tear torture out of myself by torturing you. <laughs> I really think this is his best performance. Yep, even better than Dracula. He makes you feel what he's going through. He's not just a bad guy who does bad things just because he's evil. I like to torture. Dracula, or even Perlzig from The Black Cat, are evil characters that do horrible things. Dr. Valen is just a frustrated psychopath who can't control his emotions. It doesn't justify the things he does, but it makes you accept that there's no limits to how over the top he can act. You just believe, sure, he's out of his mind. And I think it's a clever way to take the poem and turn it into a feature film. The story of the Raven, the longing for the lost Lenore, is personified in Dr. Valen. He has to go through the same torment that Poe went through. One great thing about these two Lugosi Karloff Poe films is the runtime. The Black Cat is only one hour and five minutes, and The Raven is one hour and one minute. So there you go, you can watch both of them in the same amount of time as it usually takes to watch one single movie nowadays. So check them out. <laughs> It's 
Sin and Massacre's Monster Madness. In the late 30s, Boris Karloff played a lot of mad doctor roles. Of all of them, I find this one to be the best. In The Man They Could Not Hang, he plays Dr. Savard, who's invented a device that can bring the recently dead back to life. He actually gets a volunteer, a young medical student, who allows the doctor to kill him just so he can try to revive him. Definitely a lot of faith right there, I must say. But once the doctor kills the poor guy, the police come in and he doesn't even get to finish the experiment. Then the movie becomes a court drama for a little while. We feel sympathy for him and we know or at least assume that the doctor's experiment would have worked if nobody interfered. But of course, he's convicted guilty and sentenced to death. At that moment, he addresses the court, telling them how foolish they were because they're losing one of the greatest advances in medical science. For you to condemn me and my work is a crime so shameful that the judgment of history will be against you for all the years to come. You, Mr. Prosecutor, are guilty of murdering not only me, but countless thousands who might have lived had you not destroyed the only man who could save their lives. It's a doomy monologue that's one of Karloff's finest moments. A priest comes into a cell to say prayers, but Savard denies him. Combined with this notion, I happen to notice a pentagram shape on some of the doctor's lab equipment, so perhaps there's some devil work going on here. Savard has the plan all worked out. He gets his assistant to bring him back to life using his own device. It's all in the guise that he's just donating his body to science, which is pretty clever. Now he's back and ready to get revenge on the judge and jury that sentenced him. This is where the movie starts to get real good. He invites them all to his house and locks them in. Of course, they're all in shock to see him alive again, but Savard is so casual and cocky about it. This is where the movie's so great, because we can see Savard knows he's got them all in his trap, and seeing that trap unfold is where the fun is. From here on out, the guests, or should I say victims, try to find a way out, but there's traps at every turn. One of them tries to pick up a phone to call for help, but Savard rigged it with a pointed object that comes out and stabs the victim through their ear and into the brain. This same idea was used in Dr. Fibes Rises Again. Savard is very much a classic evil mastermind, sort of like Jigsaw from the Saw movies, or a James Bond villain. There's nothing like a good bad guy, and this is Karloff in one of his most sinister performances. At one hour and four minutes, it's worth your time. <laughs> it's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness. We're done with the 30s, the golden age, so I figure if I'm going to do at least one from the 40s, I might as well pick another Val Luden flick. And of those, I might as well pick one that has Karloff and Lugosi. I mean, let's face it, they're the kings of horror so it's only fitting I include their last movie together. It's been very clear all along that Lugosi always got the shitty end of the stick. Karloff would always get top billing and greater salary. Combine that with the fact that Lugosi turned down Frankenstein and Karloff stepped in and became the next horror icon because of it, so it's easy to compare their rivalry on screen with that of real life. Lugosi was often given the smaller roles, but in some films like The Raven and Son of Frankenstein, he really upstages Karloff. He was... hunting. But the fact is, Karloff was usually in the spotlight while Lugosi was being shoved aside, and this movie is no exception at all. It's like Val Luton didn't even care for him. Instead of making him a main character, gave him this pathetic role as a janitor, which is barely more than a cameo. It's a dull performance, but he has nothing to work with. The only big scene he has is where he tries to blackmail Karloff, and then Karloff just strangles and kills him. It perfectly sums up how dominant Karloff's career was, and it's very sad. Regardless, seeing them together for the last time is still the highlight of the film. But let's talk a little about the movie. It's based off a short story by Robert Louis Stevenson, which was based off an actual case. Karloff plays a body snatcher named Gray. He goes into cemeteries, digs up dead bodies, and sells them to the doctors, but eventually decides it's easier just to kill people. The main character is a doctor who practices medicine, but he needs fresh corpses for testing, so he uses Gray to murder people, which makes for an interesting contrast, because the doctor's high class and Gray is just this dirty rat. 
He knows that the doctor would be in deep shit if somebody found out what was going on, so he uses this position to take advantage and torment the doctor, who he calls Toddy. I will not have you call me by that name. Toddy McFarlane. It has some parts that drag, so it may not be as entertaining as one of the Universal thrillers, but this movie has some really effective moments. There's great cemetery sets and chilling cinematography, and its setting of 19th century Edinburgh only enhances the mood. But the real reason to see this movie is Boris Karloff. It's easily one of his best roles. He's such an evil bastard, and he's always got that shit-eating grin. Massacres, Monster Madness! House of Wax. This is a bit unusual because I'm actually talking about the remake. No, not that one, but the 1953 version. Speaking of which, I highly recommend the original 1933 version starring Lionel Atwill called Mystery the Wax Museum. It's a pretty sophisticated horror film for its time. but the first one I saw was the 1953 version. Sometime in the early 90s, it aired on TV with a special host, Tim Burton. I don't want to give away the plot of the House of Wax because, you know, it's just like, it's, it's, it's too complicated, it's too deep. It's like trying to describe, you know, the Bible or something. I... The Bible? Well, I never saw into it quite that deep, so I'll explain it in a nutshell. Vincent Price plays a sculptor, Henry Jarrett, who's giving a tour of his wax museum. You can tell that he really loves his wax figures, and he treats them as if they're real people. But then, after everyone's left, his partner comes in and says, Hey, we can get a lot of insurance money if this place burns down. No, I'd rather die myself than see my friends destroyed. I won't let you do it, and I'll kill you if you try. They fight it out as the place rapidly catches fire. There's so much momentum in this scene, it actually feels like the climax. Nothing this spectacular happens the rest of the movie. If you get into the rhythm of watching, you know, wax figures burning and their eyeballs falling out and the layers of wax peeling away, it's a, it's a very enjoyable experience. You know what? It is fun watching them melt. So I guess I have Tim Burton to thank for introducing me to this movie and putting me in the right bizarre frame of mind. Jared's left in the fire to burn. He survives, but his hands are ruined and he can no longer sculpt. So he resorts to killing people and dipping them in wax to rebuild his museum. He also has an assistant named Igor, played by Charles Bronson. There's also a burnt looking guy wearing black going around killing people. We assume that it's Jared, but it's never really explained until the end. Jared's face is actually a mask. And this is the weirdest part of the whole movie. If he's that good at making such a perfect mask, then he's in the wrong business. The film suffers from one major thing. The first scene is so good that the rest of the movie just goes downhill. As an audience, we want to see him get revenge on the partner, but it happens so early in the film. He was the only murderer that we feel is justified, but then the rest of the killings are all about rebuilding the museum, so it doesn't have as much impact. Vincent Price is great as always. This is when he started to gain his reputation as the new Prince of Horror. It's also important to note that it was shown in 3D. This was just when the 3D craze was starting to pick up. With that in mind, it's no wonder that the paddle scenes there are just to cater to the 3D gimmick. But even without it, for some reason, it's one of the most memorable scenes. Well, there's someone with a bag of popcorn. Close your mouth, it's the bag I'm aiming at. Not your tonsils, here she comes. So check it out, House of Wax. In fact, if I ever stop directing, I think I'm gonna change my name to Igor and at least work for some great mad scientist, you know? Okay then. how I'm gonna explain this one. Like most people, I first learned of Daughter of Horror because it's the movie that they're watching in The Blob. Yes, I am here. 
the demon who possesses your soul. It's the cheesiest narration I ever heard. I didn't even think it was a real movie, but yes it is. The original title was Dementia, but not only was the title changed to Daughter of Horror, the narration was added in. The plot deals with the subconscious, so there isn't really any way to describe it. Basically, this woman's going around at night having flashbacks to a horrible event from her childhood, where her father killed her mother and then she killed her father. There's no dialogue, it's like one long nightmare. It's obvious that it's very low budget, but it's almost like a student film. Watching it is like going into a trance, you just let your mind go and try not to make sense of it. Watching it with or without the narration is a different experience. Either way, the soundtrack creeps you out, but the narration gives it a little bit of cheese factor, and if you're in the right state of mind, this can be a fun flick. Giant Claw starts out like a typical 50s monster movie. It follows a pilot who sights an unidentified flying object. He tries to warn his superiors, but no one believes him. Soon, there's planes missing and a giant claw mark. It builds tension fairly well. The acting's okay for this kind of genre. It's an overall decent movie until about 20 minutes in when you see the monster. Unbelievable. Is that not the worst looking monster you've ever seen? Supposedly, Ray Harryhausen was considered to do the effects, but the producers decided to cut the cost. A special effects studio in Mexico ended up doing it, but they must have been playing a joke. I can understand they didn't have a lot of money. They had to make a cheap marionette. But did they have to give it big old goofy eyes, flaring nostrils, and a mohawk? You can't make something this laughable by accident. There's a lot of fake miniatures and overuse of stock footage, but sadly, those are the more credible parts. In that first shot, you're not even paying attention to how bad the plane looks. You're so overwhelmed by the bird. Even in the 50s, this looked bad. The poster didn't even show the bird's head. But what makes it so funny is that the rest of the movie takes itself so seriously. None of the actors knew what the monster would look like. They just had to use their imagination. Supposedly, Jeff Morrow went to see the premiere in his local town, and as soon as the bird appeared, the audience roared with laughter. Rumor has it he left the theater embarrassed and went home and got drunk. And he did a good job with the role, but his efforts are all ruined because of that silly bird. It's funny that he seems to be the one who interacts with the bird the most. He's the first character to see it when it looks like a hairball being blown across the sky. But all through the movie, he has so many encounters with it. It makes you think this guy really has a thing for giant birds. He's also the first character to coin the term flying battleship. That's how he first describes the bird, a saying that really catches on. A battleship, not that it was a battleship. Something as big as a battleship. Like we're hitting a battleship with a slingshot. A bird as big as a battleship. A bird as big as a battleship. A flying 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 battleship. All through the movie, everyone, including the narrator, constantly refer to this thing as a battleship. I can understand if they compare the bird to a jumbo jet or something that actually flies, but why a battleship? But there's more. The bird is extraterrestrial. That's right. But how it got to Earth is what I want to know. The thought of that thing flapping its way through space makes me want to piss myself. It's also supposed to have an antimatter shield. Now it's just getting absurd. And it follows a pattern. Check this out. Our plane at Pierre's. And finally, the Navy patrol plane. Well, see it? Oh no. A pattern. Okay, that bird really has a strange agenda. If instead of taking the most direct path, it just spirals out. How would you even see a spiral on that? Why didn't he just draw a straight line? 
So we have a goofy looking bird that comes down from space in an antimatter shield flying in a spiral. It's pure genius. That's why this is one of the best worst movies ever made. Of course the giant claw made it on my top 10 giant monsters video, coming in at number 1. If I could own one prop from any movie, I'd want to have the giant claw puppet. Does that thing still exist? I want to know. I would gladly buy it so I could hang it from the ceiling in my living room. At least I'd like to see it in person or just see a picture of it today. I wonder what the scale of it is. I really do. Please, somebody tell me, where is the giant claw? The Fly is a movie that's way ahead of its time. Most people only know about the 1986 remake or dismiss the original thinking that it's just a cheesy B-movie. But no, that would be the sequel, Return of the Fly. The original is a classy, sophisticated film that warns of the dangers of science. Andre Delambre is the inventor of a teleportation unit. He lives a humble life with his wife and son, but he's obsessed with his work and is always in his basement trying to perfect his machine. When he eventually explains it to his wife and how it works, it draws the viewer in because it's such an ingenious idea. Instead of relying on cars and planes, you would just step into a teleportation machine. Your molecules would be broken into millions of pieces, sent through space, and reform in the other machine. But when Andre tests it on himself, his molecules merge with a fly that got into the machine with him. The movie's devoid of cliché. He doesn't run amok as an uncontrollable monster. He's still himself but with the head and arm of a fly. He never shows his face and has to communicate visually, which makes for a really good movie. His only hope to return to normal is to find the fly that got into the chamber so he can reclaim his own molecules. There's lots of close calls where his wife and son almost catch it. It's all around a very suspenseful and emotional film. The sequel, Return of the Fly, is in black and white, which is strange considering that the first one was in color. Vincent Price plays the same role as Andre's brother, though the plot focuses on Andre's son, now grown up, who continues his father's work. Philippe, it destroyed him. It could destroy you. He was careless. I won't be. And what do you know? Another fly. God, this damn fly mask. That's better. Now, where's that tree? Where's that? Fuck this fucking thing. It's basically the poor man's version of the first movie, but it's good old cheesy fun. Curse of the Fly is a very different movie. It's produced in England, there's no Vincent Price, and there's no fly. But how many times could that happen anyway? It's an interesting movie, worth checking out for curiosity's sake. The 1986 remake starring Jeff Goldblum is more of a gross-out special effect movie that goes straight for shock value, but it still has some of the heart of the original, and I consider it to be one of the best science fiction remakes along with John Carpenter's The Thing. This time, his change from man to fly happens gradually. We never actually see him in final fly form until the very end, but when it happens, god damn is it fantastic. It's very much in tune with the original, how his face is never revealed until the last scene. And also, like the original, it had a sequel, The Fly 2. Like Return of the Fly, it focuses on the sun. This was a forgetful movie, not recommended, but in its final scenes has some pretty good fly action. None of them surpassed the ingenuity of the original, it was a huge step above most of the other monster movies of the time, and it's been spoofed a lot. In the Ninja Turtles cartoon series, the character Baxter Stockman is modeled right after him, a scientist that turns into a fly. In fact, one of the episodes was called Return of the Fly, a direct inspiration from the original film's sequel. Teleportation units seem like something that might actually happen in the future, but if it does happen, God forbid, keep those damn flies out.
o que é a vida. É o princípio da morte. O que é a morte? É o fim da vida. The Coffin Joe series is one of the most underrated of all horror films. They're made in Brazil by director and star Jose Mojica Marins. The first film is called At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul. Is that not the greatest title you ever heard? It begins with a creepy old witch warning you not to watch the movie. No bother. So right from the opening scene and the spooky credit sequence, it has that cheese factor. You know you're in for a good old spooky time. But then the unexpected happens. It turns out to be a violent, sick, fucked up, balls to the wall horror flick. It's not just because of the violence, but the character of Coffin Joe is one of the most cruel and horrible villains that goes beyond what North American cinema would allow. He's never actually called Coffin Joe in the movies, but that's the name which has been associated with his character. I think of him as one of the classic horror villains like Dracula and Mr. Hyde, but he makes even modern icons like Freddy Krueger look like a sissy. His whole mission is to find the perfect woman to impregnate and carry his evil bloodline. He kills anybody in his way and tortures women with spiders. So he's sort of like a real elaborate rapist. He hates religion and considers it to be comfort for the weak. He has many rants about it and this becomes a big part of his character. There's a scene where he's hell bent on eating meat even though it's a holy day. Hoje eu como carne, nem que seja carne de gente. This all comes to a climax in a dramatic monologue where he screams to the heavens asking for proof of God. It's a theatrical performance shown in one long take. It's the highlight of the film. <laughs> The sequel, This Night I Possess Your Corpse, goes further to show him dealing with his inner demons. The highlight of this movie is a nightmare scene where he's dragged to hell. Once he's in hell, it goes to color. It's the only color scene in the movie and it's one of the most wild depictions of hell I've ever seen. There's so much stuff going on, I notice something new every time I watch it. There's even asses sticking out of the wall. I'm serious. There were many other films featuring the Coffin Joe character. The third movie, Awakening of the Beast, used to be considered the last part of the trilogy. In fact, it was packaged with the DVD box set that's shaped like a coffin. But in 2008, Marin's made a new movie called Embodiment of Evil. Unlike Awakening of the Beast or any of the others that came in between, this one focused on Coffin Joe again. So now, this one's considered to be the third part of the trilogy. The first two are the most badass horror films I can think of that are in black and white. And both of them came out before Night of the Living Dead. But surprisingly, not too many people know about them. So dig them up and check them out. We dare you to see the monster quest of the pajama party. The first movie ever filmed in horror vision. Hollywood's latest miracle. You will scream as fiendish movie monsters actually become alive, then crash right out of the screen. Sin massacres. Monster madness. <laughs> this is an interesting one because we're going back to the midnight spook show. The golden time where monsters would run through the theater. Monsters Crash the Pajama Party was one of those interactive movies. The title explains it all. A bunch of girls have a slumber party in an old haunted house. The boys play pranks and try to scare them. But there's an evil scientist in the basement who sends a gorilla after them. That's your plot. It's as dumb as it gets. 
Toward the end of the movie, the doctor sends his monsters out into the audience. Now what would happen, people dressed up as monsters would run up the aisles and grab actors planted in the audience. The actors would be dressed like the characters from the movie, so it would seem like the monsters actually drag the people into the movie screen. You find yourself walking home alone in the dark, and you hear strange footsteps behind you. And when you turn around to look, if you dare look, you will see nothing. <laughs> but the whole reason to get this movie is for the DVD itself. It's a whole collection of obscure movie clips. It's like a spook show museum. It's the perfect DVD to watch on Halloween. You'll have fun just playing with the menus. You move the cursor around through a cemetery, an underground crypt, and a haunted house. You'll find bats, cats, spiders, and ghosts. And nothing's labeled, so it's always going to be a surprise what you find. It might be a short film, or just a random clip, a dancing skeleton, or some kind of weird home movie from the 1920s. It's a haunted box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. There's this one film that takes place in a drive-in movie theater. This guy gets up to get some popcorn or something, and he ends up turning into a werewolf for no apparent reason, and he comes back and attacks his date. And that's all there is to it. It's so simple and stupid, yet it's genuinely amusing. There's at least an hour of radio spots and posters, which is the perfect background to any Halloween party. Live on stage from Hollywood, California, three vampire people who come into the audience seeking fresh, warm human blood, plus Frankenstein in person. It transports you right back to that golden age. My favorite part is the spinning hypnosis wheel in the beginning. It actually hypnotizes you. Trust me, get the DVD, watch it on the biggest screen possible, and you'll start to feel like you're being sucked into the TV. It's crazy. And if you don't blink for a long time and just stare at it, it actually screws with your eyes so that when you look away from the TV, the room distorts, sort of like a black hole sucking all matter into the center. I'm not kidding. And it's not just me. I've tried this with friends, and we've all seen the same thing. And we don't do drugs either. The DVD comes with a booklet all about the spook show and 3D glasses. But aren't these the worst 3D glasses you've ever seen? Were they too cheap to include just a little bit more paper so that you can actually wear them? The 3D movie itself looks like it was shot in somebody's backyard and the effect doesn't work at all. But all this shittiness just adds to the charm. This is an awesome DVD. It's innocent, good old fashioned fun and it makes you feel like a child again. Check it out whenever you want a time warp back to the Midnight Spook Show. <laughs> it's Cinemassacre's Monster Madness! The Abominable Dr. Fives has a major draw to it because it stars Vincent Price, but it's one of his strangest roles and strangest movies he was in. The premise is that Fives and his wife suffered a bad car crash. His face is all messed up because of it, and he can only speak through this weird phonograph machine he created. My sweet queen, my noble wife. His wife didn't survive the crash, and he blames the doctors who operate on her. And apparently, there's a lot of them. So he goes on a mad killing spree to take them all out with the help of his female assistant. Now, if he wants to murder doctors, there's plenty of ways he can do that. Maybe a gun, poison, strangulation. But no, Fives is too classy for that shit. Instead, he takes inspiration from the ten plagues of Egypt from the Bible. This includes rats, bats, hail, locusts, and a frog mask that chokes the victim to death. Don't ask. The ninth plague, for example, is death of the firstborn. Fives kidnaps the son of one of the doctors. He has a container full of acid which is ready to pour down and kill him. But the only way to turn off the trap is to find the key. The key is implanted inside the boy's chest, near his heart. So the doctor has six minutes to surgically remove the key before the acid falls. The acid is descending. My wife existed only six minutes on the operating table. And then she was dead. You murdered her. No. Murdered her. This whole trap scenario kind of reminds you of something, doesn't it? 
Yep, it must have been the inspiration for Saw. Fives is the original Jigsaw and one of the great evil masterminds. And just to top things off, he has a bunch of mannequins playing music. Why? Well, because he's Dr. Fives. In the sequel, Fives Rises Again, he plans on resurrecting his wife. He goes to some temple in Egypt that supposedly he created, and it's full of elaborate traps which he uses to kill more people in ways that I can't even describe. It's even more random than the first movie, and I only wonder what else could have happened if there were more sequels. Well, that's all the time we have for the 70s. Tomorrow, we're jumping right into the 80s, and that's when things are going to heat up. big year for werewolf movies. There was The Howling, Wolfen, and An American Werewolf in London, which I think is close to being the all-time best werewolf movie, second only to The Wolfman. It's directed by John Landis, whose resume at the time included Animal House and The Blues Brothers. And even though this is a horror film, it has a lot of comedy. David, please be rational. Let's go to Dr. Hush. Yeah, be rational, sure. I'm a fucking werewolf, for Christ's sake plot concerns a young man named David who's on a hiking trip with his friend Jack when they're attacked by a werewolf. Jack is killed, but David survives. He's taken to a hospital in London where he has a series of nightmares. These scenes themselves are genuinely shocking, with dreams layered within dreams to the point where it becomes hilarious. He's visited by the ghost of his friend Jack, and as a ghost, the first thing he says... Can I have a piece of toast? Get the fuck out of here, Jack. Is that the kind of conversation you have with a dead person? So Jack tells him that he's been bitten by a werewolf, and now he's going to become a werewolf every night there's a full moon. Typical situation. So he goes home with a hot nurse. There they are in the house. At this moment, there's nothing romantic, nothing sexual going on, just having a normal conversation. And in one of the most abrupt transitions I've ever seen in a movie... There's shower shagging. What I want to know is what happened in between. Did he just say, can I come in the shower with you? But that's what makes it so funny, that he's becoming a wolf in every definition of the term. One of my favorite scenes is a montage where he's just hanging around the house doing nothing. There's a shot where he just paces back and forth for about a minute. All the music is upbeat, which clashes hilariously with the horror aspect. And the songs were chosen just because they all have the word moon. Blue Moon, Moon Dance, and Bad Moon Rising. But the only way I could properly review this movie is to talk about every scene, so let me not spoil it. The last thing I must mention is the transformation scene. It's probably the best werewolf transformation scene ever. The special effects guy behind it, Rick Baker, won an Academy Award. An Academy Award for a horror film? You don't hear that too often. In the late 90s, there was sort of a sequel called American Werewolf in Paris, but it has very little relation to the original film. With the upcoming remake of The Wolfman, it doesn't look like we're ever going to see a transformation scene like this ever again. There's a certain kind of joy that one gets when they discover the movie Basket Case. Finding this movie is like finding a dead frog stuck to the tire of a car. It's putrid and disgusting, but it's such an amazingly spectacular mess that you can't look away. The plot centers around a sociopath named Dwayne. At first, he comes off as innocent and humble, but you can just tell that there's something really weird about this guy. For one thing, he always carries around a picnic basket, and everybody wants to know what's inside, but that's his dark secret. He won't tell anybody unless he's a little drunk. 
guess something else I've been dying to ask you. What's in the basket? My brother. Your brother! <laughs> That's a good bar conversation. Well, just to clarify, inside the basket is his Siamese brother, and they're on a revenge mission to kill all the doctors responsible for separating them. How does this thing kill people? It's nothing more than a twisted lump of flesh. Looks like a glob of silly putty with a flattened piranha face. It looks like a squashed octopus! <laughs> or that, yeah. Well, eventually he gets a girlfriend, and his brother doesn't like that one bit. In fact, it pisses him off. Take me, Dwayne. Oh my god, what's that? Dwayne, let me out. Let me out. Hey, Dwayne, let me out! Oh man, he really takes the whole bros before hoes business real seriously. The puppet and stop motion effects are great, in the cheesy way. That's what it is, just a cheesy monster movie. But it almost becomes something more. It shows the loving relationship between two brothers, the times they have together, the arguments and trials they go through. If you cut out the horror scenes, it could almost be a heartwarming comedy. It just so happens the brother is a melted rubber head with arms and he kills people. What an awkward piece of cinematic history. There are two sequels, but that's too much for my mind to handle. Next time, young man, I find you with a worthless piece of shit like this again, you won't sit down for a week, buddy boy. Creepshow is a horror fan's dream. First you have Stephen King writing the screenplay, then you have George Romero directing, and then Tom Savini doing the special effects. What more can you ask for? <laughs> it's not one but five different short stories combined into one crazy twisted flick that doesn't hold back. It's inspired by the EC horror comics of the 1950s, such as Tales from the Crypt. They were scary stories known for their dark humor and twist endings. Creepshow captures that comic book style and does a damn good job at it. The first story is about a cranky man who comes back from the dead to get revenge on his family members. It's definitely not the best, but it gets things started. The second story is about a real dopey farmer who finds a meteorite in his backyard. Everything it touches spreads some kind of weird vegetation until it consumes everything in sight. It's pretty creative how they take something as simple as plants and make it into an epidemic. But it's also very comedic, mostly because of Stephen King's over-the-top performance. Meteor shit! I always found it hard to believe that's Stephen King in the role. I mean, here's the guy who wrote terrifying horror novels and scared the shit out of people, and here he is acting like Jerry Lewis and Jim Carrey combined. Holy old Jesus! The third story has another turnaround. Leslie Nielsen, known for his comedic roles, now playing a vengeful, evil mastermind. The wife is cheating on him, so he buries her and the lover neck deep on a beach as the tide comes in to drown them. The suspense is almost unbearable, and I never thought Leslie Nielsen could be so scary. Nobody's gonna hear anything. Now do what I told you. The fourth story is about a mysterious crate that contains a monster. This happens to be the longest episode, but the less said the better, because this is one that's sure to please. The last episode goes straight for shock value. It's just a guy being attacked by cockroaches. This is my only warning about this movie, because this part is fucking disgusting. The middle three stories, I think, are by far the best, with the other two serving as bookends. Well, not counting the scenes where there's a kid reading the comic, that's the real bookend. The best way to describe this movie, it's just all over the place. You have horror movies that take themselves real seriously, but this is one that just busts loose. It's all fun. I can't think of too many movies like this. Nobody ever goes for this anthology format too often with more than one story. 
unless you count the sequel, Creep Show 2, but it's not on par with the original and only has three stories instead of five. There is an unofficial sequel, Creep Show 3. George Romero and Stephen King had nothing to do with it, and supposedly there's going to be more sequels. So forget the sequels and check out the first one, because it shows you how fun a horror movie can be. When it comes to movies about ghosts, nothing holds up to Poltergeist. It's co-written and co-produced by Steven Spielberg and directed by Toby Hooper. You can really sense both of their styles going on here. With Spielberg, you can tell it has that top-notch production value. And as for Toby Hooper, it doesn't have that low-budget sensibility as Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it has the shock value and is very disturbing. The plot centers around a regular everyday family who's being haunted by spirits that are pissed off because the house was built on top of a burial ground. The spirits, for whatever reason, target five-year-old Carol. They're here. They communicate with her through the TV and eventually take her into their dimension. The rest of the movie, the mom and dad are trying to get her back. It's a lot like the Twilight Zone episode, Little Girl Lost. In this episode, a girl ends up trapped in another dimension. Her family tries everything they can to get her back, and through the process, they have to learn all about dimensional portals. Lots of metaphysical talk going on, and it really gets under your skin. So does Poltergeist. It's not just about ghosts, it's about theories concerning the powers of the dead. Where do the dead go? What separates their world from ours? It's some really creepy stuff. I don't know what hovers over this house, but it was strong enough to punch a hole into this world and take your dog away from you. It also has its share of less subtle moments. Anyone who makes a top 10 list of most horrifying movie moments, I wouldn't be surprised if more than one makes the list. There's the old scary tree, there's the clown, and a guy ripping his own face off. Horror movies don't get much more gross than that. There's a scene involving skeletons coming up out of a pool. Supposedly, they used real skeletons from a medical supply because it was cheaper than having to make fake plastic ones. Knowing that makes it a whole lot creepier. Two sequels were made, but unfortunately, many of the cast members died during a very short time span, including Heather O'Rourke at the age of 12. This is why many people call it the Poltergeist Curse. When it comes to horror movies, Poltergeist is one of the most famous. It has the Spielberg name attached to it, and it had a big budget. That almost gives the false impression that it's not as terrifying as the more underground horror movies. But I can honestly say, it's one of the most memorable, disturbing, and bone-chilling that the genre has to offer. <laughs> consider Reanimator to be like a 1980s version of Frankenstein, and I don't think that's too far off. The original story by H.P. Lovecraft in the 1920s was inspired by Mary Shelley's Frankenstein novel. The plot revolves around a mad scientist named Herbert West. He invents a serum that brings the dead back to life, and there's a professor who wants to steal his invention, and all this rivalry over a serum that doesn't even work right. It has a terrible side effect. Whatever it reanimates gets up and goes crazy. The first victim is a cat, which makes people really upset. It's true, whenever an animal dies in a movie, it's real sad. But all the people that die, who gives a fuck about them? There's a lot of gruesome special effects, and it satisfies any gorehound's thirst for bloodshed. But what makes the movie is the character of Herbert West. He's played by Jeffrey Combs, who does a great job. You take one look at his face and you just know he's not fucking around. This guy doesn't care who he has to kill. All he cares about is his work. It's very much like Peter Cushing from the Hammer Frankenstein films, just gone more extreme. The guy is a complete asshole. Meg, what the hell are you doing in here? I... Would you please leave? 
Now, easy. All these experiments he's doing, he's not even in his own house. The owners are renting out their basement, and that's where he does all the stuff, with zero respect for the people that actually live there. But that's also the comedy of it. There's a really cheap special effect involving a head decapitation. You can obviously tell how the effect is done, that there's a hole in the lab tray. But that's what sets the tone of this movie. It's silly and off the wall, not to mention there's a scene where the head is giving head. It's a movie that embodies the whole genre of 80s horror. It's like Frankenstein, but it also falls into the zombie genre. It has a little bit of Evil Dead in it too, and it's all around just a sick, disgusting film. It's as if they grinded up all the horror cliches, digested them, and then puked them up into an abominable, dripping, blood-soaked, pulsating mess. It was followed by Bride of Reanimator and Beyond Reanimator, and director Stuart Gordon is hoping to make a fourth one entitled House of Reanimator. If that happens, it will be a rare and special occasion, because today, the notion of making a horror sequel is becoming extinct. Now, it's all about remakes. So please do not remake Reanimator. Zombies are probably the biggest subgenre of horror films, and out of all the zombie movies I can think of, Return of the Living Dead is one of the best. The title is kind of misleading. Most people assume it's a sequel to one of the George Romero movies, like Night of the Living Dead, but it's a completely unrelated movie. However, it does have some reference. It begins with one of the greatest pre-title sequences ever in a horror film. This guy Freddy gets a job at a warehouse that sells medical supplies. He wants the job just because it feeds his fascination. He gets to see dead bodies and it's cool. So the boss realizes he likes this gruesome shit and tells him a scary story. Did you see that movie, Night of the Living Dead? Yeah, 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 that's the one where the corpses start eating the pupil, right? So according to his story, Night of the Living Dead was based off an actual case. Some kind of gas brought the corpses back to life and it's been covered up by the government ever since. It's a chilling story that's delivered real well and actually creeps me out. So the boss takes him down to the basement to look at the bodies. He makes one simple blunder and next thing the gas escapes, bringing not only the original corpses back to life, but everything in the whole warehouse. And that's just the opening scene. What makes these zombies different from the Romero series is that first of all, they specifically eat brains. Next, they can talk. And they're much more gruesome than the Romero zombies. Their bodies are all decaying, falling apart, and mutilated. Some of them are even reduced to pure skeleton form. And it's not just human zombies. Anything that once lived now comes back to life, including butterflies and a half of a dog. But the major thing that separates these zombies from the Romero versions are the way they're killed. In the Romero films, and usually the traditional sense of the zombies, all you need to do is destroy the brain, either by shooting them in the head or hitting them hard enough. But here, every part of their body is independent, so if you sever a limb, it'll move about on its own. I thought you said if we destroyed the brain, it'd die. It worked in the movie! Well, it ain't working now, Frank. You mean the movie line? This raises the stakes and makes it almost impossible to kill the zombies. There's a scene where they try to burn them, but that's the worst thing you can do, because when the ashes go into the air, it comes down in rain, which brings to life more zombies. And it doesn't just affect the recent dead, it even goes as far as resurrecting bodies from the cemetery. It all started with a simple mistake, and everything just keeps getting worse. You find yourself laughing because of how horrible this problem can get. The movie has everything. Horror, comedy, gratuitous bloodshed, naked dancing, memorable characters. What do you think this is all about? You think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. And great special effects. There were many sequels, but none of them matched the original. If you're a zombie fan at all, seeing this movie is mandatory.
In my first season of Monster Madness, I reviewed the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Along with The Exorcist, I consider it one of the first horror films of the modern age. It was a gritty and disturbing piece of cinema with a very realistic tone. Then a decade later comes Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Nobody would expect it to be as good as the first one, but with the original director Toby Hooper back, you'd think it would at least keep with that same tone. But instead, it goes for a surreal, over-the-top, ridiculous, and comedic tone that doesn't even feel like a sequel, but more like a spoof. This becomes obvious just from the opening scene. There's two guys riding around, shooting everything in sight. What's their deal? Next thing, a corpse comes up on top of a van and starts attacking them with a chainsaw. Then it turns out it's Leatherface. But why in the holy fuck is he holding a corpse in front of him? This time, Leatherface is played by Bill Johnson instead of Gunnar Hansen from the original. Not that it really matters, but the character now acts completely different. He's constantly doing the stupid dance with his chainsaw. And I'm not kidding, he does this the whole movie. Then there's Chop Top, played by Bill Moseley. He has one of the best introductions. His first scene is where he comes into a radio station, uninvited, just an obsessed fan. You're my fave. <laughs> Me and Bubba, my little brother, we listen to you every night. <laughs> to make things even more weird, he has a metal plate in his head which he keeps picking at with a hot coat hanger. Chop Top is one fucked up dude. The last of the villains is the old man played by Jim Sido. He's more stable than the other two characters, but just as disturbing. And he's the only returning actor from the original film. Then you have the good guy played by Dennis Hopper. And would you know, he's crazier than all of them. He's a sheriff, so you'd think he would just use a gun. But instead, he decides to go after Leatherface with his own weapon, a chainsaw. I'm the Lord of the Harvest. And he's got three of them, one in each arm and one strapped to his belt. What a maniac. Bring it all down! Bring it all down! I'll take you back to hell! I'll take it out! Then there's the radio DJ played by Caroline Williams. She's the only normal character. She spends the whole time being freaked out, as anybody would, but the weird part is that she becomes Leatherface's love interest. There's actually a scene where he dry humps her with the chainsaw. What the hell is that all about? The final scenes just get even crazier. Dennis Hopper goes nuts. And he fights Leatherface, which has to be the most epic confrontation since King Kong vs. Godzilla. Leatherface continues to fight even after he's had a chainsaw rammed through his body. When I first saw this movie, I hated it. But over the years, I've grown a certain appreciation for it. It's a comedy. The title is a bit misleading. I think this is one instance where there shouldn't be a number two at the end. Because it shouldn't be considered a sequel. It's a parody. But if you look at how the poster mocks The Breakfast Club, that should be an indication of how off the wall this movie is. I suppose Hooper was so aware that he couldn't top the original, so he went for something completely different. He wasn't involved in any of the further sequels, and from there, they just kept being ridiculous. Motherfuck. What started as a serious horror film just became a sick, twisted mockery, man. Stephen King said, I have seen the future of horror fiction, and his name is Clive Barker. That's the author in which Hellraiser is based on, the original book, The Hellbound Heart, but I guess Hellraiser sounds a little better. At this point, the slasher genre was well underway, and it was well established as a genre that's just for fun. You watch a horror movie to be entertained, and sometimes even laugh. But Hellraiser is a movie that's so fucked up you don't even look at it unless you want to be freaked out of your mind. 
A man named Frank finds a strange puzzle box, which unleashes a group of creatures known as the Cenobites. They're basically a masochist's dream because they're all about causing pain using hooks and chains. But they go as far to rip Frank apart. But he's not really dead, he's just a decayed mess underneath the floorboards, I guess. His brother Larry moves into the house with his family. Larry accidentally cuts himself, and the drops of blood go under the floorboards. Like the Hammer Dracula, that's all it takes to resurrect Frank's dead body. But now he's just a sickening sack of guts with no flesh. In order to become fully human again, he needs more blood. So he uses his brother's wife to lure men back to kill them. Which is strange considering how many people get killed, it only gradually builds his body back. Even though all it took to begin with was a little bit. The Cenobites are not in the forefront of the story, which may be a little disappointing. There were many sequels which began focusing more on Pinhead as the main villain, though he was never actually called Pinhead in the original movie. He was never my favorite of the Cenobites. I like the guy with the teeth and the melted face. Or even better, those weird creatures that start appearing at the end. Is that not fucking great or what? Watching this movie is like having a very creative nightmare. Nothing makes sense. But why should it? In the 1980s, there were all kinds of doll toys like Cabbage Patch Kids and My Buddy, and it seemed often these type of things were made in the movies. The movies advertised the toys, and the toys advertised the movies. It's a never-ending commercial. But then comes along the movie that's the anti-commercial, Child's Play. When this came out, nobody ever thought about dolls the same way again. It's about a kid who thinks his doll, Chucky, is talking to him. You know perfectly well that you're making this up. But I'm not. Chucky's alive. Really. He but it's funny Chucky. how children never find anything unusual about this, and they just assume that the parents are going to believe them, like it's perfectly normal. Shouldn't the kid be like, oh my god, holy shit, the fucking doll's talking. Well, you never see the doll come to life until much later in the movie. The suspense is the best thing this movie has going for it, but it's a shame that we never have a chance to suspect that it's all in the child's mind. There's no question whether or not Chucky's really alive, because they explain it flat out in the opening scene. A robber gets shot down in a toy store, and just before he dies, he casts some kind of black magic, transferring his soul into the doll. If that's not enough exposition, there's a scene later on where the mom and the detective recap on the whole incident. Then there's a scene where we actually meet the man who taught the voodoo spell. There couldn't possibly be any more explanation. The Twilight Zone episode, Living Doll, told the same basic story, but with so much less explanation, the suspense was so much more effective. But Child's Play can be credited as to etching the killer doll into this generation's subconscious. Chucky is a memorable slasher villain worthy of being idolized along with Jason Voorhees and Freddy Krueger. Hi, I'm Chucky, wanna play? That was his catchphrase. I remember when this movie came out, I was having dinner over one of my friend's houses, whose name happened to be Chucky. We must have all been around seven or eight years old. So anyway, Chucky was just goofing around, picked up a knife and said, I'm Chucky, wanna play? The mom's response was to grab him by the wrist and say, I'm mommy, wanna spanking? The best comeback in the history of moms. But the funniest thing Chucky ever says is the very first time he ever talks. I said talk to me, damn it, or else I'm gonna throw you in the fire! You stupid bitch, you filthy slut! Did you fuck with me? That, in a nutshell, is why Chucky is so great. And nothing can stop him. He keeps coming back in sequel after sequel, which only went further with the comedy. Who the fuck is Martha Stewart? Don't fuck with the Chuck! Chucky, you're the man.
gotta love a horror movie that begins with the word the, because it tells you everything you need to know. Nobody second guesses that a movie called The Brain is about a brain that goes around killing people. Of the the genre, this is one of my favorites. The plot revolves around an evil scientist played by David Gale, who you might remember as the professor from Reanimator who gets his head cut off. He runs a TV show that brainwashes people. He gains control of their minds with the help of this weird brain monster. There's a rebel high school student who's the only one who can resist the brain's mind-controlling power and save the day. But not without some horrific hallucinations. Wait a minute. What you're seeing is his point of view. That visual effect right there, that's what he saw. Imagine if you're driving a car and see an evil brain flashing in your face, and then all of a sudden your vision breaks up like a triangular wipe transition from a cheap video program. The special effects are a real joy. The brain is both terrifying and hilarious. It always has that wicked smile, and you never really see how it gets around without any legs. Now I can't help but get on the topic of Ninja Turtles again. Doesn't this remind you of something? A brain with tentacles? Krang, of course. It makes no sense to me to make three live-action Ninja Turtle movies and never to include Krang. Some people have suggested that maybe the special effects would have been too difficult, but look at the brain! That's Krang right there, and it was done two years before the first Ninja Turtle movie. It wasn't the first Killer Brain movie. There was the brain from Planet Arrows and Fiend Without a Face. But this is the only one I know of from the 80s. And unlike all the other horror films of its time, there were no sequels and so far, no remake. Thank God, the brain exists in a world of its own. Now there's some food for thought. Toby Hooper. How about that? After making movies about psychopaths and ghosts, this time he takes on the topic of spontaneous combustion. Now that refers to a series of real-life unexplained cases, where it's been said that people have spontaneously erupted into flame. It's pretty damn funny to think that the human body can just blow itself up. But if it is true, then I wonder how accurately this movie portrays it. Sam is an ordinary guy who's learning of his terrible origin. His parents were working on some kind of nuclear experiment in the 1950s. Shortly after he was born, they both had a spontaneous combustion, becoming human flamethrowers and reducing their bodies to ash and bones. Now Sam has grown up and starting to have fiery accidents of his own, especially whenever he's mad. Talk about being hot-headed. Even when he's on the phone, nobody's safe from him. Listen, you idiot! I don't think this is as important as your lousy snap. That's John Landis right there with one hell of a cameo. Sam's played by Brad Dourif, who you might recognize as the voice of Chucky. Here, he's not a villain, but just a tragic man who can't control what's happening to him. His amazing performance saves an otherwise mediocre movie. Look at the expression in his face. You can feel the intensity, the frantic turmoil that agonizes within the disconsolate immoralization of the soul. That is the face of a man who explodes and shoots fire. His girlfriend is the one who suffers the most. You just don't want to be around this guy. Oh, he's got the hots for you. He just called me, Lou, and fire came out of the phone! He called me, and fire came out of the phone. This guy is a ticking time bomb. Now that's a common phrase, but this bomb happens to be nuclear. Fine, God damn you! Get ready to turn down your IQ because it's time for Leprechaun. There's really not much to say about this one. It's about a killer leprechaun that's trying to reclaim his lost gold. I want me gold! I want me gold! Want me gold! I need me gold! By the way, he really wants his gold. It's as stupid as it sounds, and it's as stupid as it looks. 
It stars young Jennifer Anastane, I mean Anastan, in her first feature role. I'm telling you, it always goes back to horror movies. First she's in a horror movie, then a horrible TV show. I'm just kidding, I never even watched Friends. But I do watch movies about leprechauns that murder people with pogo sticks. You'll never think of Lucky Charms the same way again. <coughs> the leprechaun's played by Warwick Davis. He's also remembered as Wicket, the main Ewok in Return of the Jedi, and as the title character in Willow. When I first discovered that, it blew my mind to be able to connect two memorable characters from my childhood. Like, holy shit, Willow and Leprechaun are the same guy. The Leprechaun's makeup is pretty cool, but the only reason to watch this movie and its sequels is because of the Leprechaun's personality. There was an old man of Madras whose balls were made of fine brass. So in stormy weather, they both clang together and sparks flow out of his ass. <laughs> One thing that's remarkably asinine is that the Leprechaun has a fear of four-leaf clovers. That would be like if Dracula was afraid of bats. There were many sequels. By part three, the Leprechaun's in Las Vegas. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, man, you do that pretty good. And after that, he goes to space, then to the hood, and then if that wasn't enough, he goes back to the hood. It's common that most horror series get ridiculous as they go on, but Leprechaun is ridiculous from the start. It's a terrible movie, but it has its place in the history of horror films. It opened the doors for all kinds of silly mascot horror icons. The world of cinema needed a killer Leprechaun. Fuck you, Lucky Charms. <laughs> Cemetery Man is the most offbeat, random, and confusing horror film I can think of. But when you look at all the monotonous and uninspired horror crap being shat out by Hollywood, Cemetery Man is one of the most unique that the 90s has to offer. It's Italian, and the original title was Della Morte Della More, which means of love and death. But if this is a love story, it's the most hyper-accelerated love story I've ever heard of. Francesco is the caretaker of a cemetery. He sees a woman weeping over the grave of her newly dead husband. Instantly, he falls in love with her. I guess I can't blame him. Working at a cemetery all night must get lonely. He has no one to talk to but his bumbling assistant, Gall. Not to mention, this woman is ridiculously beautiful. So Francesco pursues her, and all he has to do to get her interested is say that the cemetery has a nice crypt. It's like in my dreams. This is my dream. Oh, I couldn't ask for anything more. I mean, right away, she's turned on by it. I guess she's just a sick bitch who has a death fetish. Next thing, they're having sex on top of the husband's grave. And all that happens in the first 20 minutes. Also, they're zombies. It just so happens that the dead rise from their graves on the seventh day. And this is a regular occurrence. So Francesco spends most of his spare time shooting them. So if he's already used to this, it shouldn't have come as such a surprise that the husband comes up too. The woman's killed, I don't believe we ever find out her name, so she comes back and he shoots her in the head. And that's just the beginning. There's also a subplot with Gaul. He falls in love with this other girl who happens to be the mayor's daughter. Not to mention, pukes on her. Somewhere down the line, she gets killed, comes back as a severed head, kills her dad, and befriends Gaul. You threw up on me. How sweet. Then comes the fucking Grim Reaper. It's one of the most jaw-droppingly awesome depictions of the Reaper I've ever seen. But he's only there for a few seconds, and here's what he has to say. If you don't want the dead coming back to life, why don't you just kill the living? Shoot them in the head. What the hell kind of logic is that? Next thing, Francesco's going around shooting people and checking their names off the phone book. What the fuck is going on with this movie? Then he starts meeting other girls who look identical to the first one. It's kind of like Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, where the main character is haunted by his lost love. But in Vertigo, he has a fear of heights. In Cemetery Man, it's the woman who has a fear of something. You want to know what it is? Take a guess. What is it that she fears? 
You give up? It's penises. Yeah, she has penis phobia. I definitely never heard that one before. So he goes to the doctor to get his penis cut off. Now, look, this is becoming even more difficult to explain, but all throughout the movie, he's been called impotent. So I don't even know which is supposed to be true, but all I can say, never before have I watched a movie and wondered so much about a man's penis. Nothing makes any sense at all, but it's fucking funny and that's the whole appeal. It's not as serious as Night of the Living Dead, not as funny as Return of the Living Dead, and not as gory as Brain Dead. But if you're looking for a zombie movie that's a little different, this is it. Smoking is not allowed Shut in here! thousands, horror films start going down the shitter. Nothing is original anymore, it's all about remakes now. But if I were to pick one horror movie from the 2000s to end this year's monster madness, I think I'll go with The Devil's Rejects. Even though it's a sequel to House of a Thousand Corpses, the only thing they share are the same characters. Otherwise, they're two completely different movies. My opinion is that Devil's Rejects is by far the better film. It follows three serial killers who are running from the law. We don't know why they want to kill people, it's just like something they do for fun. They don't just kill them, they humiliate their victims, verbally abuse them, and make them suffer in every way imaginable. They're horrible, vile characters, but then there's funny scenes like this where they get ice cream. Shut up! fucking fruity! Listen, there is no fucking ice cream in your fucking future! Bill mostly plays Otis. He's so compelling in the role that fans started up an independent campaign to get him an Oscar nomination. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. Then there's Sherry Moon Zombie playing Baby. Gorgeous, but evil. Last of the three, and my favorite, Sid Haig as Captain Spaulding, the most demented and hilarious killer clown character you'll ever see. What's the matter, kid? Don't you like clowns? Why? Hey. Don't we make you laugh? Aren't we fucking funny? You best come up with an answer, because I'm going to come back here and check on you and your mama. If you ain't got a reason why you hate clowns, I'm going to kill your whole fucking family. All right, I'll get your fucking ass. Ken Forey plays a great supporting role as one of their friends who happens to be a pimp. <laughs> Those just standing around like stonefoot roosters in a fuckboard! <laughs> <laughs> then there's the sheriff, played by William Forsythe. You ever say another derogatory word about Elvis Aaron Presley in my presence again? I will kick the living shit out of you! He's the one who goes after the psychopaths, mostly on a personal level because they killed his brother. He wants to see that they get what they deserve. And we go along with him because he's the hero, right? Well, the first time I saw this, I was so horrified by the things they did to these people, I wanted to see the sheriff catch them. And he does. But when it happens, he goes to the extreme. He ends up becoming a psychopath himself, and now we sympathize with the killers. Most movies establish the good guy and bad guy right from the beginning. But here, you don't know which is which. It leaves it all to the viewer's emotions. That's great filmmaking. It was written and directed by Rob Zombie, and this is his masterpiece. His dark humor and love of horror movies comes through, in the same way writers like Kevin Smith and Quentin Tarantino always interject things that they love into their movies. He chooses his music wisely. As much as I'm a fan of Rob Zombie's music, I'm glad he took a more distant approach and used all kinds of southern rock. He's even able to take a song as famous as Free Bird and use it in a way that nobody has. Whereas some scenes in House of a Thousand Corpses just felt like a Rob Zombie music video. The Devil's Rejects is to me one of the iconic horror films of the decade, and by true definition of the word, it is a horror film. 
I only recommend seeing it if you're up for some really sick shit. That concludes Cinemassacre's Monster Badness 2009. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you get a chance to watch some of these movies if you haven't seen them. I tried to pick out some famous ones and some obscure ones. Just try to change it up a bit. I hope to do it again next year. So until then, happy Halloween. Thank <laughs> you.